So today we're going to talk about something I see in the office frequently as a neurologist is my memory loss. Is it concerning? Is it Alzheimer's? There is not a week or day that goes by that I don't see a patient who is expressing some form of memory loss or a concern about themselves or a loved one. So I'm going to go into a case and we're going to teach how a neurologist like myself approaches a patient who is concerned and afraid or wants to know how to get better or feel better. So we're going to get right into it. So Helen is 68. She came to see me because she's concerned about her memory. She says that she's forgetting names, having trouble finding certain words. Uh, her mom had Alzheimer's, so she naturally is worried. She's paying more attention now about things that can concern her about losing her memory or forgetfulness, like misplacing her keys. She's still driving. She's still managing her finances. She's still taking her medications on time. She uses her iPhone. She goes on the internet. She's independent in every single way. But she asked me, is there something I need to be worried about? Because she is noticing her symptoms and she's concerned. And again, I tell my patients at times when you can notice that you're losing your memory and you can tell me exactly those instances where you are losing your memory, you're bringing into memory the time where you can remember it. So that's actually a good sign. When it's a bad sign, which we're going to get into or what's more concerning, we're going to talk about that later on on this video. So this is what I told her. You don't have a diagnosis right now. Okay, you're not a disorder right now. You have an opportunity. So in this video, we're going to look at how to detect a memory issue early on. What tests can be done as real answers? And most importantly, what can you do to protect your brain from starting a memory loss or cognitive condition? So again, what's the framework and what's the foundation very quickly? And you can look at my other videos to see what exactly those five pillars of health, but I'm going to go into the five pillars of health. The foundation, emotional and mind health and brain health is number one. Number two is nutrition. Number three is exercise. Number four is sleep. And number five is physical health and longevity. How to live quality life through all of those four pillars leading into your fifth pillar. So Alzheimer's touches every single pillar here. It depends on how you live in all five. So that's where we go into education. So what is normal and what is concerning? So let's talk about the education and understanding. So education allows us to become more aware so it opens up our mind to look at those wiring and the programming and how we can change our brain, how we can develop this neuroplasticity for longevity and physical health. We all forget. That is the issue. Our brain what it does forget. That's how we are evolving. And it's actually why we remember and why we forget are certain ways our brain uses uh, this model for protection, survival, and we're going to get into that later on. We're going to have a separate talk on a section of why we remember and why we forget. But when you forget when you're younger, you're not concerned about it because you're 25, you know you're not having Alzheimer's. But if you're in your 50s, in your 60s, your 70s, you're starting to forget, then that's the age where you're starting to get concerned. So what I look at is interference with instrumental activities of daily living, like higher cognitive tasks, like managing your bills and finances, going on the internet, remembering your appointments, navigating technology, driving a car without a problem. Those are instrumental activities of daily living. That's how we look for disability or a little bit of impairment. And usually a family member will notice these or a friend and will bring the patient into my office. So if those are intact and you have an occasional word finding issue as you age, that could be normal aging. But you got to be careful because there's an overlap between aging and mild cognitive impairment or early signs of Alzheimer's dementia. But here's where it gets important. If there's a family history like hers, then we have advanced tools. We have these new biomarkers. We have amyloid PET scans and we have a neurological examination and we take a history from the patients. And this is how we can look at Alzheimer's related pathology and we can attack it before symptoms become disabling. So what are the biomarkers scanning and early diagnosis? Alzheimer's does not begin at the age of 70. It begins, believe it or not, in your 40s and your 50s. You start developing amyloid plaques by silent inflammation, amyloid accumulation, and these what we call tau changes in the brain. So amyloid is the protein that develops inside the brain and that tau are the tangles that develops in the brain that can interfere with these networks and neurons in the brain causing neurological symptoms. So one of the most powerful tools we're using now is amyloid PET scans. So if someone shows early signs or has a family history and is concerned, we can now order what we call biomarkers. We can actually measure the amount of amyloid by a ratio 40 to 40 in the blood 
and in the brain and if the ratio is low at a certain level that can be a risk now we're not looking for a diagnosis of alzheimer's we're looking for risk so if a patient has a family history or a patient has early symptoms then these are ways to look at risk so we look at tau which can be measured as a tau protein of 181 and 217 that we have now or we have amyloid 42 40 ratio in the blood or at times we can do it in the cerebral spinal fluid so a positive test or biomarker that shows risk doesn't mean you have alzheimer's so if you have a clinical history plus biomarkers then we move to what we call an amyloid pet scan we look at the amyloid burden in the brain and by a PET scan or a study that sees that the amyloid lights up in certain sections of the brain. And that gives us a critical window so we can take action early. Because if we catch it early, we have monoclonal antibody treatments. We have lecanemab and denimumab. Those are in specific patients. Again, those are the tools that I use. That's not where I'm gonna jump to. I'm just saying those are the tools I'm using. So I'm looking for patients to see if they are showing signs of early Alzheimer's that we can attack it early. I also wanna help patients reduce the risk of getting Alzheimer's. So we have all types of group of patients. So we want to analyze the patient because when we treat the patient with a monoclonal antibody, there is risk for what we call aria which are development of swelling, it's our ARIA-H or ARIA-E, which is ARIA-H's risk of hemorrhage or edema. So these medications do have a risk if started and if the patient does have a ApoE protein, which is ApoE3 or 4, uh, which we're gonna talk about, that increases your risk of hemorrhage. So the truth here is real medication is prevention because your daily choice matters more than any scan or infusion so education about alzheimer's and in this case remember so we're educating our patient why she's concerned why she's afraid is that it's not just a memory condition alzheimer's is a chronic progressive inflammatory brain condition and it starts often very early it doesn't start in your 70s or 60s it actually starts in your 40s or 50s you start accumulating amyloid and tau and it's not genetic remember the genetics, it's not all genetic. There are cases of your genes. I just wanna make sure you're not a victim of your genes because there are modifiable ways to reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's. So yes, genetics matters. In the field of epigenetics, which is above the level of genetics that turns on and off genes based on a lot of your risk factors, based on decisions, that are related to health. So when we have a genetic testing or genetic matter, we look at this ApoE gene. Genotype of ApoE2 is protective. ApoE3 is neutral. So if you're E3, E3, it's neutral. If you're E4, then it increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. Now, if you're E3 slash E4, so you get one from mom, one from dad, then you can get a risk about 2.5 to 3 times the risk of getting Alzheimer's dementia. If you have E4, E4, then you can have actually almost a 8 to 15 times the risk. So it's a very high risk. Again, it's not a death sentence. If you do have one of those genotypes, then you really need to pay attention to all of those five pillars of health that we're going to get into. So Apple E4 is not a life sentence. It's a risk factor. So I tell my patients, genetics loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. So when I focus on modifiable risk factors, what can you do every day? Sleep, food, thoughts, your activity level, these influence your future brain health. So let's go over those five pillars of health. Pillar number one, the healthy mind. Remember, the brain doesn't just store memory, it stores meaning, emotional stress, anxiety, rumination, damage to the hippocampus related to chronic stressors and inflammation can actually shrink your cognitive bandwidth. You need purpose, not puzzles. A lot of my patients think by doing Sudoku can build cognitive reserve. You want to build what they call cognitive reserve. So when an area of the brain goes down, another area can take over. So you want to stay socially active, emotionally engaged, mentally challenged. It's more than just doing puzzles. That means learning something new, sharing your story, teaching others, and being connected is so important. That is pillar number one. Pillar number two, diet and nutrition. Inflammation drives Alzheimer's. What you put in your body, what your fuel is, is a very important concept. So a Mediterranean diet, what we call the MIND, M-I-N-D diet, which is rich in greens, healthy fats, berries, 
olive oil based products low in processed sugars can reduce your risk avoid high glycemic foods and insulin resistance pillar number three is exercise now it's not just about walking walking is great but the brain needs also resistance training training with weights muscle loading balance work resistant training increases igf1 and bdnf these are key supportive molecules sedentary behavior watching television all day long that can be the worst thing for your brain. They call that type three diabetes because what's happening is that your brain is a muscle and you can see clearly that the muscle of the brain atrophies when it's sedentary. That's why my patients that get into their 60s and 70s and 80s that have purpose, that are not in front of a television, that are active with walking, training, working on their balance, their core exercises, adding weights, that is a key ingredient. Number four, sleep. Sleep isn't just rest, it's neurological repair. There is a glymphatic system that activates at nighttime. It washes all the toxins out. It washes amyloid out of the brain. So deep sleep preserves memory. It prevents cognitive overload. So if you sleep poor, that's an increased risk and your brain needs to be detoxed. So at nighttime, when the garbage delivery system turns on, you want to remove all those toxins so your brain can detox. Pillar number five, physical health and longevity. So this is where we get into that symptom of memory loss. Remember, you need one, two, three, and four. And at the end is physical health and longevity. So you cannot separate the brain from the body. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, obesity, inflammation related to chronic stressors, inactivity, they're all major risk for Alzheimer's. Sitting is the new smoking for your brain. The prescription is not Prevagen, it's not just doing puzzles, it's purpose, it's movement, it's blood flow, and it's social engagement. Don't wait for a diagnosis, start now. Build your cognitive reserve, that area of the brain that's gonna take over. Move your body, connect with people, sleep like it's sacred and feed your brain with intention and a goal because you don't need a supplement you need a strategy subscribe to the healthy mind for more neurology led content please drop a comment if your memory is failing or if you have questions related to memory how to improve your memory about anything that has to do with memory loss and alzheimer's drop a comment and i will expand i will make sure that i can help you all feel better mm -hmm.